Well, good morning and welcome to the campus, Church Bayview. We're so excited to gather together this morning and worship our Lord. We invite you to stand with us this morning as we lift up our voices and our songs. We invite you to just dive in this morning. We want this to be a space where you feel comfortable to worship and just encounter the presence of our God. So if, we, if you want to clap, dance, sing along, maybe you want to take this time to, to pray and reflect, we invite you to just dive in with us this morning.
We thank you, we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You be seated. Welcome here. My name is Pastor Zach, and I welcome you on behalf of the Canvas Church Bayview. And I just have a few announcements coming at you this morning. So number one, um, if you're newer with us, we would love to connect with you and resource you with everything you need to get connected uh, into our family here at the Canvas Church Bayview. Um, so if that's you, please text WELCOME to this number right above my head. It's also on the back of your program if you're not quick enough to pull out your cell phone right now. Um, and also on Tuesdays, our staff team actually prays uh, has a prayer time every week. Um, so if you have a prayer request, please text PRAY and then your request to that exact same number and we would love to pray for you. Um, so just uh, just a heads up, so Easter is on the horizon, which is scary, I know, but Easter is on the horizon, so we would love to celebrate Easter with you. Good Friday, uh, we are actually doing a little bit of a change up, so we are having our service over at our Bathurst location, obviously on Bathurst Street, uh, two services, 9 and 11 a.m. Uh, so that's going to be a joint service with uh, worship members from all the three campuses all coming together for Good Friday. And then we're right back here on Easter Sunday in the theater at 9.30 for our Easter Sunday service. And we would love to see you there. Uh, hmm. I don't know why that's in there, to be honest. That's like this week and the registration's over. So we'll skip that one. All right, cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and as always, you can connect with us. Minor bumps, it's fine. You can connect with us at the Campus Church Baby Dancing. All of our online directory, our events, news info, all of that is right there on that website. Uh, at this time, we're going to invite the kids, all the way little, all the way up to grade five, to head on out to. I don't know what you're saying. Awkward. Oh. All right. We're half done, Zach. We're all good. Give us five more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Sing us a song or something. <laughs> Well, I know a joke. I don't sing. Well, a little bit. You want to hear a joke? All right. So, I once knew a guy that wanted to be a banker, but then he lost interest. I'm not on the joke. All right. Cool. Well, as soon as the offering's finished, we're going to invite the kids, pick it up, and head on out to Kids Rock. Um, they have an awesome program waiting for you. There should be a blue, yeah, a couple of blue t-shirts right there, uh, ready to take you to your program. Uh, and then after the kids go out, we actually do this thing called SOMA, and SOMA is a word that means body and connection. Um, so we actually use this time uh, to connect with one another, maybe a new friend, an old friend. Uh, there's going to be five, a five-minute timer on the clock. Uh, grab a coffee when that timer runs out. We'll resume with the rest of our service. Uh, but at this time, okay, we're going to dismiss the kids, and we're good to go. But please give them 10 seconds to get out of their chairs and down the seats before we start our summer. Thank you. We're going to be uh, doing our third week uh, and our final week looking at this whole kind of sub-series, looking at under pressure. What does it mean to be uh, under pressure and understanding what that means is to say that all of us face different experiences where we are under enormous amounts of pressure at certain points and seasons within our lives. And it's in these moments where oftentimes it brings out the worst in us. But at the same time, it can also bring out the very best in us. When we think about moments within our recent history and even in back further in history, and we think about these moments of natural disaster, or we think of wartime, or we think of uh, times of, of a, ter a terrorist attack, we even think of these times of th thinking it brings out the worst in humanity. But in reality, it can also bring out the very best in humanity. When we experience enormous amount of pressure within our lives, when we experience uh, kind of a, a number of things that are weighing down on us, it can ultimately cause us to explode or implode. But at the end of the day, the, the Lord Jesus can actually utilize these moments of enormous pressure to cultivate within us the changes that he desires for us to make. Difference is in our lives that cause us to ultimately be the men and women of God that God is calling us to be. Let us pray. Our gracious, our gracious Heavenly Father, as we dive into your scriptures this morning, and we continue to look at this understanding of being under pressure, 
we ask that you would lead us and guide us and direct us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the scriptures that I want to look at today, I think remind us of an analogy I gave just a few weeks ago of a dog. And I kind of gave you the analogy of a dog being cornered that's feeling threatened. And if it's showing its teeth and you stick your hand down into that dog, what happens? Bites. It bites you. It's going to hurt. Oh, what a cute puppy. Ouch. And ultimately, what's going on here is that, you know, if a dog is feeling threatened, it's going to respond. And nevertheless, I think that's also human nature. And we've been talking about this Jewish ruling council, which is known as the Sanhedrin. And we've seen three examples within Scripture. Uh, pardon me, we've seen two examples within Scripture. And each time the intensity is, is just mounting. And today we're actually going to look at a third and final time in the Sanhedrin in Scripture. And how this Jewish ruling council in the book of Acts as it shows up in chapter, end of chapter 6, chapter 7, and the top end of chapter 8, we see this ruling council really starting to be like this dog. That no longer are they willing just to be cute and fuzzy and, uh, and playful, and no longer are they just showing their teeth, but they're, they're actually biting today. And so we're being bit by the Sanhedrin, and we want to take a look at what that looks like. And so if you have your Bibles with the, you in traditional form or in digital form, I invite you to turn with me. And we're going to begin in uh, Acts chapter 6, and we're going to start by looking at verse 8. We're reintroduced to this character named Stephen. Now Stephen, a man uh, full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. This fellow named Stephen, we get introduced to him actually just prior to this section of scripture. Uh, if you recall last week, we talked about deacons. And one of the deacons that we were introduced to was this fellow by the name of Stephen. And so he's a leader within the church, and if we recall the, uh, the branding of a deacon, it's one to serve the body of Christ. And so Stephen is in the business of serving the body of Christ. He's a servant of God. And yet at the same time, we see that Stephen is facing challenges even in the midst of his service. Take a look at what it says. Verse 9. Opposition arose from various members within a particular synagogue, and they began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave to him as he spoke. So they secretly persuaded some men to say, Oh, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemy, blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law, and they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stops speaking against the holy places, and against the law, uh, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses that's been handed down to us. So ultimately, what's going on here? You see, you got this fellow by the name of Stephen, and he's in conversation. He's doing his gospel duty. He's sharing the good news. And he's in conversation with this synagogue. And you might be asking, why is there a synagogue in Jerusalem? At the time, uh, the city of Jerusalem would have had number, numerous numbers of different synagogues. And oftentimes, uh, these synagogues would be culturally unique to that particular synagogue. And so if you can imagine this, uh, in our church, we have a very multicultural uh, congregation. There's some with Korean backgrounds, some of you are, are with, uh, from more of an Asian descent, a Latin descent, uh, and obviously uh, I'm missing lots of different descents. Um, but so you might have a Lebanese synagogue over here, you might have a, uh, like a Korean synagogue over here, uh, you get the idea. And so there's these different synagogues 
or small groups within the group of uh, synagogues in Jerusalem. And so Stephen is trying to serve a particular synagogue, and they get kind of upset with him. They don't like exactly the way he's presenting certain ideas. And so they get kind of in this strife relationship. They get into this argument with Stephen. And what's interesting is that it says that the Holy Spirit provides the wisdom. It says the Spirit gave him what he needed, the wisdom to speak. It's really kind of where we see in Luke chapter 12, verse 12, where we see that Jesus actually speaks about giving us the Holy Spirit. In, in uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 12, it says, The Holy Spirit will teach you at a time and will tell you what to say. This is Jesus speaking. So Jesus tells himself in the Gospels that he's going to give us the Spirit of God. Cool, eh? That, actually, that's the same Spirit we receive. And so Stephen has received the Holy Spirit. And he's being equipped with the wisdom from the Holy Spirit as these people are trying to challenge him. And so he's got a, a divine wisdom here, and he's responding, and it's creating a great friction because they're realizing that they can't best Stephen. And so they decided to do what the only thing they knew how to do is they were, they were trying to deceive him. They were trying to say, yeah, I'm telling the truth. So they come up with these deceptive lies in order to try to trap Stephen. And they kind of stir up a bit of chaos. And so they arrest Stephen. They pull him in front of the Sanhedrin. And they produce falsified testimony. And so look at what it says here. While they're doing this testimony, we get this really odd and rather peculiar verse. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So I'm really not sure what this is. I'm trying to imagine. Try, imagine you're in the Sanhedrin, and you're staring at Stephen. What, I don't know what, maybe it's like one of those paintings where the face is like, oh, you know, like kind of like this glowing face. I, I don't know what this is. Like, I, I'm not sure whether it's figurative. I don't know whether it's literal. Uh, either way, it's saying that Stephen's face is sort of angelic-like. But just to be clear, Stephen is a man. He's a man. He's flesh and blood. He's a, he's a physical person. He's not like part angel, part man. Uh, just to be clear, he's a disciple of Jesus Christ. And whether he's kind of got this supernatural ability at this point from the uh, divine presence, it is very clear, based on what's said next, is that the Spirit of God is indwelling inside Stephen. I've actually heard about accounts of missionaries and people serving in, in very difficult circumstances when they're being accused, and they actually talk about, and I've heard real-time like people in our age talking about this, uh, how they've been accused, you know, whether they've been in North Africa or in other regions of the world, where they, people are threatening their life and they feel like the Spirit of God has taken over what they're saying. And I think that's exactly what's going on here. Is the Spirit of God is indwelling in Stephen, and Stephen is allowing the Spirit of God to work and move through him. But look at what the high priest asks. A high priest asks Stephen, Are these charges true? Are these things true? Now let's think about this. Imagine you're Stephen. And you've been grabbed. And if this is not something you desired. It's not something you wanted. You've been grabbed. And you've been put in front of this judiciary group of people that are very angry with you. You have really two options here. One is you can kind of uh, say things that will soften the blow. Perhaps you can bring them a couple notches down and, and be a peacemaker and just appease the crowd. Or you can know what you believe. 
Or you can stand on the truth of what you know. And I use this analogy of a compass very pointedly in the sense that we have to hold a compass oftentimes and we have to understand our compass. And to say, do we understand our compass as having a moral compass of what's truth? Because I think there's so much clarity needed in our society when it comes to this idea of truth. What is truth? Donald Trump has certainly uh, kind of caused a bit of confusion when he says fake news. What is truth? Is it absolute? Is it fictitious? Is it a hypothesis? What is truth? And oftentimes our morality fits in this same category and, and we hold up a truth. And what is true north? What is true north? And, and you know, can you imagine a compass that's just, you know, going, I wonder what is true north and it just spins? And you're like sitting on the top of the North Pole and it just spins all the time and you have no idea the direction that you're going? And ultimately, Stephen is being asked, what is truth? For you, what is true? Well, at the end of the day, Stephen knows who he is in Christ Jesus. And not obnoxiously, not trying to create greater kind of chaos in the room, but he sticks to his guns. And he begins to almost preach a sermon. I wonder whether his face was glowing or something. Because in chapter 7, the majority of chapter 7, for almost 50 verses, is his sermon. And I'm not to, today I'm not going to go verse by verse in here. But know that in chapter 7, and I certainly would encourage you to read it when you get home. Chapter 7, you have this sermon by Stephen. And really there's two highlights. He's saying the nation of Israel has a history of persecuting those who came in the name of the Lord. That the nation of Israel has a, a, a way of focusing in and zeroing in on people who are being made to be instruments for God and ultimately are challenging the people of Israel to come back to him and they have a history of persecuting these prophets. Because Israel didn't want to hear it. And he actually uses the most recent example of Jesus Christ himself as the ultimate prophet, as the ultimate son of God. And then he draws a secondary comparison all the way through his sermon. And that's that he talks about how Israel has always had either the tabernacle or has had the temple. And just because they had these instruments of God, it didn't necessarily correlate with faithfulness. Just because you have a church doesn't mean you have faithfulness. Just because you have these different things in your life doesn't mean that you're faithful. And that's what Stephen is kind of driving home at. And he's really trying to challenge the people. And I think also as the reader, we need to be challenged. Just because we do these things that are quote-unquote Christian, does that in therefore make us faithful? Does it make sure, is our compass right? Is it, is it in line? Look at what it, how Stephen wraps up this section of Scripture. He says this. He's wrapping up his, his sermon, so to speak, in verse 40, 51. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and your ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always, always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet that your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. Obviously making a reference to Jesus Christ. You who have received the law that was given through the angels have not obeyed it. Well, you can imagine here within the context, these, these, this Sanhedrin, they're not very happy about what he's saying. They're not being convicted, so to speak, of saying, oh, I, I feel guilty because of what Stephen's saying. They're enraged. If Stephen's goal was to calm them down, it didn't work. 
They become enraged. And this is what happened. It says, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious. They were furious. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up at heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing right at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, this must have been just even a kind of a slap in the face. At this, they, they covered their ears and they, they yelled and they screamed at the top of their voices. And the whole room almost erupted in almost like a mob-like scenario. And they rushed him and they dragged him out into the city uh, gates or out inside on uh, the cobblestones. And they, and, and they began to uh, throw stones at him. The witness is laid their coats at the feet of some other young man. His name was Saul, and we'll talk about him in a few minutes. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And ultimately, within this text, this is not a, an easy text to digest or understand. But ultimately, he knew where his compass was. He knew where he, his, his statement was. He was saying, God, I want to be faithful to you. And they killed him for it. He was willing to give up his life. But you notice something in there. It, it tells you a little bit about his heart. It wasn't about him wanting to one-up them and stick it to them and say, yeah, Sanhedrin, you should know better. No, he had a heart of compassion even in the midst of them punishing him. Do you recall what Jesus said when he was on the cross? Jesus is on the cross and he's dying and he says, forgive them. Forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Jesus, on the, on the cross, he had a heart of compassion. Look at what Stephen's doing. Stephen, in his last dying breath, he says, forgive them. Forgive them. He has, even in the last moments of his life, as he's being stoned to death, he has a heart of forgiveness. Speaks to the understanding of what he's trying to do here. The other thing that I think is really uh, pointed here within the text is that we're also getting introduced to a, another player. There's this new fellow by the name of Saul. Take a look at what Saul says here. Now we're now kind of focused in on this character named Saul. And Saul approved of their killing of Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. <clears throat> Godly men were buried and Stephen, uh, sorry, Stephen uh, was mourned deeply by them. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged both men and women and put them into prison. See, Stephen was like a little amber. It was like a, a tiny little amber going into dry kindling. You know, it's interesting, uh, during drought seasons, you always hear them talk about this, how they're so concerned in areas of drought about smoking. And they're really concerned about smokers uh, in areas of drought. You know why? Uh, the fire. The little bits of ash off of a cigarette, that little tiny bit of ash going into dry tinder, it can ignite something. And that's exactly what Stephen was. Stephen was that, uh, almost like this little bit of tinder. It was so dry, it was because of the intensity there was a level of intensity 
Time and time again, we've looked at all of these over the last couple of months. We, we saw how Peter was in front of the Sanhedrin. We, talk, we looked at how there was a number of apostles in front of the Sanhedrin. Each time, the intensity was getting greater and greater, and this time, it was too much. This time, the Sanhedrin had had enough of these ridiculous Christians. We couldn't, they couldn't handle it anymore. And so they decided to take action. And they literally mobbed Stephen. <coughs> and he was this spark plug. That he was this spark that, that ignited these flames. And ultimately, ultimately led to this a massive persecution of the Christians. But it's interesting that, and we're going to get into this in uh, later weeks right after Easter as we continue our book of Acts. But it talks about how in the great persecution, and it talks about all of these Christians scattering Jerusalem. Up until this time, Christianity has really been focused in on the city of Jerusalem. Well, guess what all these Christians do? They end up scattering. No longer is Jerusalem safe. They scatter all around the known world. And what do they carry with them? Anybody know? Say, say it louder. The gospel. They carry the gospel, then they carry it with them wherever they go. And all of a sudden, this persecution that was meant to stop out Christianity, well, actually, it results in something so much greater. What the devil intended to be evil, God was able to use it as a spark to grow the kingdom of God. But I want to come back to this morality concept. Because I think of this scripture as interesting because I, I, I think we get an incredible example of Stephen who understood his compass incredibly well. And I, all of us have a compass, so to speak. A moral compass. And all of us have these barriers of where we, we think, you know, yeah, I, these are the non-negotiables, these are the things I'm not willing to negotiate on, these are the things that I am willing to negotiate on. And sometimes I think people can be a little too uptight. But I would say more and more in our society, I think we're almost too loose. We allow our moral compass to be shaken all over the place. And sometimes our compasses can even get a little bit broken. And it it's not like our compass all of a sudden breaks. Most of our moral compasses actually get off just by like a one or two degrees. And so if, you're, if you know anything about trekking through the bush, if you're into mountaineering or anything like that, you imagine, think about this. Imagine you had to get over these mountains and you had a couple of days to, to travel from point A to point B. Now imagine the compass that you were utilizing, and this was the only instrument that you had, was broken. And it, was, and it, was, it wasn't really broken, it was just a little bit broken. So it's, it's off degrees just by a couple of degrees. And I would say most of us wake up in the day when, when our morals, morals get a little bit messed up, we allow them to just get tilted just off a couple of degrees. Now we travel through the bush and over mountains for a few days. Are we gonna end up at the same location we intended? Anybody know? No. Oh, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> We're going to end up in a different space. Can everybody say, I'm going to end up different? End up different. Now, man, we're going to end up different. We're going to end up different than what we had intended. I think most of us who would call ourselves Christ followers, and there's some of us here to this morning that wouldn't call ourselves Christ followers, and that's okay, and we're checking it out. But for those of us who wouldn't call ourselves Christ followers and say, yeah, this is truth, and we can get excited about it. Yet in the midst of wanting to follow scripture, we allow our compass to get a little bit off. And we'd like to say, oh yeah, if I was Stephen and I was standing in front of the Sanhedrin, yeah, I'd stand for truth. But would you? Do you know what truth is for you? And do you know what the non-negotiables are for you? I think oftentimes, and far more often than you recognize, we are put in ethically challenging places within our workplaces, 
within our family constructs, within our usage of the internet. We are constantly bombarded with ethical choices every single day. And the question then becomes, is where is our moral compass? You may not have to stand in front of the Sanhedrin later today, or next week, or next month, but I will tell you, later today, or this week, I promise you, every single one of us will have a moral choice in front of us. And the question is, what is your compass? And are we willing to understand and ask ourselves, what is truth? What is truth? I think, you know, this, I, I've been kind of talking on this almost negative kind of picture of death and life and death, but I, I do have a, a life story for you. And it really comes from a fellow that uh, I, I would say is a, is a friend, he's a, certainly a warm acquaintance that I've been able to get to know over the last number of years. And as I tell you this story, I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. This fellow um, has gone through a number of challenges within his life uh, over the past 12 months. He's lost his job. He's uh, lost a loved one. And so he's, he's experienced financial hardship. He's experienced uh, grief. Uh, in a certain regard, he's certainly experienced major mental health challenges. And actually, this fall, he uh, went and uh, attempted to take his own life. And it was in that space that he found himself in a hospital, recovering from this attempt. And he began to write. And he shared this poem that he wrote, and I, and I thought it was particularly pointed, because I think for him, he's trying to find a new truth for himself. He's trying to establish his own moral compass. And I think so oftentimes, we get messed up in our minds of what our moral compass is. And I love what he calls it. He says, happy to be here. I'll read it to you now. When the sun and the moon collide and the stars will shine and fall into the sky and sparkle, cherish the hush of the morning dawn. Close your eyes and listen to the hopeful song. Know that the path you travel today will lead you to a place of peace. I am happy to be here. I'm happy to stay. There is a strength when all is calm. Live the humble grace and serenity so true. The best time to plant a tree is 20 long years ago. Never fear. The next best time is now. Today is the day to make up for all that went wrong. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to stay. Listen to this song inside that reminds you of all that is kind. The simple words that do not always rhyme allows for the truth to be enjoyed by all. When it is time to change the words on the page, believing that the new road will have new joy allows for a peaceful night of peace. Imagine that we will all enjoy a restful night of rest. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to stay. I think my friend was trying to recognize that his moral compass was broken. And oftentimes, we need almost a moral compass reset and recognize that our true north is actually found in nothing else than the truth of who Jesus Christ is in our life. Once a month we have a thing called communion. 
It's where we have an opportunity to be reminded of who Jesus Christ is. We come and we come and commune with him by taking the cup and taking the wafer. And it's almost like a compass reset of saying, Lord Jesus, you are my true north. You are the reason why I get up in the morning. You are the one who I judge my morality on. You are the one who I find truth and untruth in. Just like Stephen knew his compass, knew the truth. May we all be reminded of the truth that we follow this morning. So when you're ready, I'm going to invite you to come to either side. You can come to this side or this side. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, I invite you to do that. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, I want you to know it's so, so good to have you here. And, and that's okay. I'm going to invite you just to sit on back and relax and just ask that question. What does it mean to be in a relationship with Jesus? So when you're ready, come to either side. And we'll participate together, so hold on to the elements.
passed it to his disciples. And he says, this, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he passed it to his disciples. And he says, this is my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we do this now, reminding us that you are our true Lord. That you died on a cross for us, but you were resurrected. And we were able to have new life in you. Freedom in you, Lord. To be able to chase after all the things that you've called us to, to follow after you in faithfulness. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray together. tradition, as we sing our last song this morning, uh, we're going to be taking up a benevolent offering. This, uh, uh, we take up a secondary offering once a month on the first Sunday of every month to go and meet the needs of those within our congregation who might be going through some financial hardships. And we also uh, utilize these funds to perhaps use uh, to help with counseling or something like that if uh, individuals are struggling. And then we also utilize this fund to uh, support Welcoming Arms, which is an organization in our community that really helps those in Aurora that are uh, most needy. So I invite you to give and continue to worship uh, as we close out our service today.
us this week, Father. That we would just lean into your word, into your presence, and how good you are, Father. We thank you so much, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us and worshiping.